We're talking this month about the life of Jesus, our Savior. We borrowed the expression from 1 Timothy 2 and verse 5, which refers to him as our mediator, the man, Christ Jesus. And so we're looking at, at Jesus from the standpoint of as, as he dwelt on earth and as he walked among men, those lessons that we can learn as we observe, as we consider carefully, as we study him. And it's instructive to do that, to learn about Jesus, our Savior, from several standpoints. And among those, he's revealing the Father. He would say on the night uh, before his crucifixion to Philip, with all the other apostles, minus Judas present, but he said, he that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And so he's giving an exegesis of the Father. That's the word that's used in John, the first chapter. No one has seen God at any time. Verse 17 says of John 1, the only begotten God who's in the bosom of the Father, the only begotten Son who's in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. The word declared is the word from which we get the English word exegesis. And so God is, is explained by Jesus. Jesus gives an exegesis of the Father. But not only do we learn these lessons and, and see the Father revealed and see Jesus as we saw this morning, his compassion for us that was expressed in so many ways. We just looked at passages that have that word compassion. But in all of this, the, the application for us is that we want to be more like Jesus because that's the definition of a Christian. He's one who belongs to Christ. He is like Christ. And this is the thing that in Romans chapter 8 that God planned before the creation of the world, that those that are called by the gospel be conformed to the image of his Son. And so Jesus would say in Luke 6 and verse 40, that a disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone when he's been fully trained will be as his teacher. And so that's our goal, to be more and more like Jesus. And so I hope some of these objectives will be accomplished as Devin and I address these topics in this month of October, the Lord willing. I want to turn your attention as our first scripture uh, this evening, our first passage to examine for this lesson. I wanted us to look at Luke chapter 4 and verse 16. Luke chapter 4 and verse 16. This is very early on in Jesus' ministry. In fact, this is the first thing recorded by Luke right after Jesus' baptism and the temptations. And uh, there are other events that happen that we find in the Gospel of John that belong to this early ministry of Jesus. But here's something that happened up in Galilee. And so it tells us in Luke 4 and verse 14, Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee. And verse 15 says, he taught in their synagogues, being glorified by all. The synagogue is an interesting development. The synagogue came into being during that intertestamental period. In the time of the Persian Empire, when the decree of Cyrus permitted the Jews to go back, and really other peoples as well, to the lands from which they had been dispersed by the Assyrians and the Babylonians, a remnant returned, but many stayed where they were. That's called the dispersion. And the Jews, many of them did not want to lose their identity as the people of God. And so the word synagogue simply means coming together, people coming together. That's all it means. Not to supplant the temple. You couldn't offer those sacrifices we studied this morning at the, at the synagogue. You had to go to the temple. You had to go to Jerusalem. But the synagogues in the various communities were simply places, well, a lot like a church building where the Jews were coming together to read God's Word, to study His Word, to have prayer, to encourage one another. And so this had been done for centuries, coming to the period that we're, that we're looking at right now. In fact, that's one of the things that made it what Galatians 4 and verse 4 calls the fullness of the time. That's one of the things that God used to make it such for people to be prepared for the coming of Christ. And as you know, when the apostles went forth with a great commission, the first place Paul would go to in any city would always be the synagogue. He'd go there first with the message of the gospel. So that's the setting here where Jesus is going in the synagogues teaching. That's where people came together. That, that's where they would come together with regularity. 
There might be other times that they would meet, but every Sabbath was a given. On the Sabbath day, they would be meeting there on the Sabbath, as well as other times. That brings me to verse 16. So Jesus came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. Now, the reading, all of this passage is, is one of those very interesting passages. He's reading from a text in Isaiah. Isaiah is the most messianic of all the prophets. In fact, there are more messianic prophecies in the book of Isaiah than all the other prophets put together. And this is one of those messianic passages. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Jesus read that passage and closed the book. That means He rolled up the scroll, handed it to the attendant, and sat down, and all the eyes the eyes of all that were in the synagogue were fastened upon him. And how wonderful it was that this passage that Isaiah in the 8th century B.C. had by the Holy Spirit of God articulated. Jesus, when he read this passage and sat down to comment on it, said, today this passage is fulfilled in your hearing. What Jesus is saying is, you're looking at the one. You're listening to the one that Isaiah was talking about. And that's a wonderful thing. Unfortunately, a prophet has no honor. No prophet, verse 24, is accepted in his own country. Jesus was from Nazareth, and of all things. The people were saying in verse 22, marveling at his gracious words, but is not this Joseph's son? And so they, they uh, and the parallel in uh, uh, and, and Mark indicates, is, is this not the carpenter? And, and so uh, they are offended at him. In fact, so much so that they tried to take him in verse 29 on the, on the hill upon which the city was built that they might throw him down over the cliff. They were so angry at Jesus that they were going to put him to death. So it didn't turn out well. We're talking tonight about Jesus as he walked among men. He was rejected at his hometown of Nazareth. But my real point in turning to this was the first passage where we started. That part that it says about Jesus. We're learning from Jesus. We're looking at the man Christ Jesus. And the text says that um, he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. What that means is that this was habitual. That each time when the Sabbath day rolled around, that was each week, where Jesus would be found is he would be in the synagogue. If he wasn't here, if he was in some other part in it, uh, of, of the country in Israel, he would be there. But his custom was that when the synagogue met, he would be there. And he would be involved there in worship of the Father. He would be involved where there was the reading of Scripture and the teaching of God's Word. And this idea of as his custom was. You know, we can, uh, we can use the word custom in, in different ways. I mean, I guess there are good customs and bad customs. But... What this is talking about is what someone customarily does. What this is talking about is what is habitual. And you know, all of us are, all of us are creatures of habit. And there are good habits and there are bad habits. And it's a good habit every first day of the week for us to come together. That needs to be customary. That needs to be habitual. In other words, in none of our homes do there need to be conversations, are we going to go to church this morning? Will, be, will we be attending services uh, on Sunday evening? Will we, are we going to go to class? Well, I don't know. We'll just have to wait and see. Are we going to go to class on Wednesday night? Well, we'll, perhaps we will. I'm just not sure yet. That's not good. That, that just needs to be something that's understood. This is habitual. And whatever other things are in the schedule, that church services aren't scheduled around those things. Those things need to be scheduled around what comes first. And we need to be clear on that. That this, that this, we've come together on the first day of the week. We've come together at times that have been set aside for classes and study of God's Word. That's not a case of trying to browbeat people and, you know, uh, that, that uh, you know, you got to be here or else. 
I was glad when they said to me, let us, come, let us go up to the house of the Lord. It should be a delight to us to worship God. And so we're not talking about something that is done grudgingly, but should be a great source to us as we're, if we're truly, as Jesus said, hungering and thirsting after righteousness. Why would that not be our custom to, to follow Jesus, to be like Jesus? So just as this was going on as the Old Testament law was still operative, we who live under the law of Christ, that, that our coming together is, is important to us. And in doing that, you see, we're following the example of Jesus. You can't read very far in any of the Pauline epistles or the other letters as well, but what you see, that there is the understanding that the people that were converted in specific areas, they're part of that local congregation. That's important. That local church is God's functioning unit. That's the, that's the, that's the organization that God has given. And it's expected that each of His people will be a part of that local congregation and, uh, and will be, uh, as, as men are qualified, appointing men to serve as elders and working together in harmony to do the work of the Lord. And so Jesus, as His custom was, when the Sabbath rolled around, there are other things he could be doing, but he'd be there. That, that was his custom. That's what he would do. Well, let's see some other things as we look at the life of Christ that perhaps we can learn from. And I'm turning back now to the Gospel of Mark. In Mark, the 10th chapter, this is a, our boys and girls currently on our, in our young people's class, they're, we're, we're going over the life of Christ there and there's seven periods of the ministry of Christ in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And one of those periods is the Perean ministry. The word Perea is a word that just means beyond. And since most of Israel lived on the western side of the Jordan, what would you call that land on the other side? Well, that's beyond the Jordan. And so long-standing practice of that gave that region its name. It was called Perea. It was actually a district on the eastern side of the Jordan River. And Herod, Herod Antipas was the one who ruled over Galilee and Perea during the ministry of Christ. And so that's where Jesus is in Perea at this time in Mark chapter 10 before he goes into Jerusalem, as we said this morning, to be killed. So what, uh, to be crucified. So what happens here in Mark the 10th chapter it's a busy time during this ministry. And what has just happened is a well-known scripture to us in, in Mark chapter 10, verse 1, where Jesus went into the region of Judea the, by the other side of the Jordan. That's Perea. And this is when the leaders came to him with a question to try to entrap him about divorce and remarriage. Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? And the text says in verse 2 that, that they, they said this, testing him. It's one thing to ask an honest question. It's one thing to ask something sincerely because you're seeking for truth. It's another thing to ask testing him. Their motives were not good. But nevertheless, Jesus still taught the truth and pointed out that what God has joined together, let not man put asunder. That divorce was never part of God's plan from the beginning. And uh, so... But, but my point now is not to give an exposition of God's marriage law, but just to talk about context. That, that's just happened in Mark 10, down through verse 12, 1 through 12. Now, verse 13 tells us something. They brought young children to Jesus. They brought young children to him that he might touch them. But the disciples rebuked those who brought them. The disciples knew Jesus was busy. They knew Jesus had a lot on his mind. They knew that Jesus was trying to have especially time to instruct the disciples. And they didn't see that the children were necessarily all that important, that this was all that urgent, that that should be a priority matter. And so actually they just took it on themselves. They didn't ask Jesus, well, what do you think? Do you want to see these people? Do you want to see these children? They don't do that. They just rebuke the parents. And say, I don't know what, how they phrased it, but it's basically get those kids out of here. You know, take them away. Don't do that. It, it says they rebuke those who brought them. That means don't do this. Stop it. Get, get, get away. Get back. And by the way, I'm reading from Mark 10 and verse 13, New King James, and it says young children. 
this is found in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, which those three are called the Synoptic Gospels, not John, but Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And Luke 18, verse 15 says infants. So infants are included. Infants. Young children, this text says. The text here says that he might touch them. Matthew's account in Matthew 19, 13 says that he might put his hands on them and pray. These, these parents are not just curiosity uh, seekers, you know, to say, hey, look, this is, this is a famous person wanting their child to see something like that. They're bringing them to Jesus to touch them, to put his hands on them, to pray for them. That's a good thing. And I'm, I'm so thankful that as we see what Jesus did, when Jesus saw it, when he saw the disciples were rebuking them, telling them to take the children away, he was greatly displeased. He was greatly displeased, the text says, and said to them, to the disciples, let the little children come to me and do not forbid them, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus went on to say, Assuredly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter it. And so Jesus in verse 16, it says, He took them up in His arms, put His hands on them, and blessed them. That's a passage that makes me smile. I, I love to think about that. And, and again, what this, what this does is we're seeking to understand more about the man Christ Jesus. This passages like this help us to see what's in his heart and what is a matter of importance to him and important as far as his, his investment of his time. He only had so much time because we're talking about his being in the flesh and he's subject to a schedule and to time like anybody else while he's on earth. And yet they were worthy of his time as far as his part and his willingness and so I see Jesus motioning or speaking to those parents, whatever, and, and they're coming back now. They've been sent, and he says, no, don't do that, and, and brings them, and just one by one, he's in no hurry. The text says he took them in his arms, put his hands on them, and blessed them. And so when I look at Jesus, I see that he was attentive to little children. He's not trying to entertain them. He's not saying, you know, we just need to provide more things for the young people. They just don't have enough to do in Perea. And so if we'll do this and do that, that'll be. The text is talking about his picking them up in his arms. He put his hands on them. He blessed them. He was concerned about their soul. He was praying for them. And these are the things that are important. I'll tell you, most of the time, children have entertainment enough. They have activities enough. They need people to pray for them. They need to people, people to be concerned with putting first things first from their infancy. These were infants that were brought to Jesus. I don't know. It may just be a drop in the bucket. But I'd like to think that our young people's class, which we've conducted here this month, makes 34 years. I'd like to think that that reflects the fact that we believe, as Jesus did here, that infants, that young children, are worthy of our time, that they're deserving, that they're important. And so we want to pray for them. We want to teach them. We want to study with them. Couldn't help but think tonight, as Silas is up here capably leading, he doesn't need me to help him with anything about a song. But where it started out was right here, just like so many others have. I'm not, I'm not taking credit for the good voice he has and for his abilities. I'm only saying he was given an opportunity from his infancy to develop those things with support from so many others. I'm not one that, you know, back in the good old days and just dwelling in the past. But you know, we at Hansville have had some good cheerleaders here. We've had people like Sister Ballard, Lola May Knight, the Freemans, the Meltons. You know, the Meltons would get here and they would sit over here after we were in the new building before anybody else would get here. 
And his, over time, we, of course, people come and go, people pass away. But we've had often a large number of people that did not even have any kids in the class that were just here to lend support. And I always thought that was so much appreciated. Maybe I don't state enough goals that we have with things like that. But the importance of providing an audience for the young people. My, my goal was that there would never be a time that a child was not used to standing up in front of the people. You know, if it's just a class like any other class, we could do that in one of the classrooms. The reason for doing it here in the auditorium was to have a setting so that, that they would grow up, the, the, the young men in particular, used to the idea of being in front of a crowd and directing singing. And, and again, I know that that may just be a drop in the bucket, but for whatever good that that has contributed for the years, we, we, give, we give glory to God. But I'm simply saying that that's, that's one way that I believe that there is the application that we see here of Jesus being attentive to little children. I want to turn to another passage with you. I want to turn to Luke chapter 23. This is a great passage too. All, all of these are great passages and passages from which we can learn about Jesus. We're, we're spending our time well when we're studying about Jesus. Jesus, the master teacher, Jesus who shows us the traits that we need to have, Jesus who shows us the Father. And the thing that I want to stress in Luke chapter 23 about Jesus, the man Christ Jesus, is his willingness to forgive. Oftentimes when there's a situation where people cast blame, uh, you know, there, there's his story and her story, and then there's somewhere in between. And a lot of times, in reality, there's probably enough blame to go around with several parties, but not so when it comes to Jesus. Here's somebody that was totally innocent. Here's someone who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. And it's not like, well, he had some part in this when he was beaten, when he was scourged, when he was spat upon, that thorn of crowns pressed on his head and they'd hit it time and time again and then nailed to that cruel cross. It was not for anything he had done. You couldn't say, well, yeah, but he did this or that. Totally, totally innocent. And yet in Luke chapter 23, in Luke 23, we find Jesus Verse 33, there they crucified him, the criminals, one on the right hand, the other on the left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And that says so much. He's praying, forgive them. In particular, for these that are involved, as the immediate context shows, in his crucifixion. Of, of people that were his enemies, people that were treating him despitefully, people that were uh, abusing him. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. His willingness to forgive. I mentioned Isaiah a while ago. Isaiah chapter 53 says in verse 12, he made intercession for the transgressors. And so Jesus is praying on their behalf. Now, we need to probe that a little bit further because Jesus' willingness for them to be forgiven was at awful cost. For them to be forgiven of sins, Jesus had to die for their sins and for yours and mine, of course, as well. But that wasn't just something he, he could express verbally and that takes care of everything. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. That shows his willingness. That shows his desire for them to be forgiven. But it cost Jesus a lot. He gave his life for their sins and for ours. And the way that prayer was implemented, the way that prayer was answered, 50 days after Passover, when Jesus was crucified, 50 days after that is the next feast, the Feast of Pentecost, the day of Pentecost. The gospel sermon was preached, and there Peter could say that you have taken him, and by the hands of wicked men you have crucified and slain. And when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart. And they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Now Peter doesn't say, well, you don't have to do anything really because Jesus has already prayed about that. He tells them to repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. 
and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So Jesus praying, Father, forgive them, involves a lot of things. What Jesus would have to do for us to be forgiven of sins, for them and us, and also for them to have an opportunity to come to know and obey the truth. But Jesus made intercession for the transgressors. And it's so important. It's so important that you and I have that same quality, that we have that willingness to forgive, that we pray for those who sin against us, that we pray for our enemies, and that we're willing to extend forgiveness. You remember the the servant who owed the 10,000 talents, and the Lord in that parable of Matthew 18 had compassion on him and forgave him the whole thing. A debt he could never ever pay forgave him the whole thing. And when he went out from receiving such grace, he bumped into a servant that owed him a hundred denarii, just a drop in the bucket compared to what he had been forgiven of. He took him by the throat and began to choke him and said, pay what you owe. He said, have patience with me, I'll pay you all. But he would not and had him cast into prison. Jesus is telling that parable to, to point out So will my Father do to you, if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. And so our being forgiven is conditioned upon this very quality that we see in Jesus. Our being willing to forgive as Jesus also forgave. And as we said this morning in James 2 and verse 13, judgment without mercy shall be rendered to him who has shown no mercy. If we're unwilling to follow Jesus in this regard, then we cannot and will not be forgiven according to Jesus himself. Well, there's one other point that I want to make, and then the lesson will be yours. John chapter 4. I want to talk tonight about Jesus' priorities. And when we're talking about Jesus on earth, I think it's important for us to see when Jesus walked and he walked long enough, he got tired. Just like we would. He'd get thirsty. He'd get hungry. Just exactly like we do. We know that because in John chapter 4, Jesus left Judea. He left Judea, verse 3, and departed to Galilee. That's verse 3. And in this route he chose, he's going to go through Samaria. And what happened is that um, he arrived there. And it says in verse 6, it was about the sixth hour, which I take to be around noontime with Roman time. And then the text says that Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, sat thus by the well. He was tired. He was sitting down. The disciples went on into the city to buy food. But he was tired. He was weary from walking. Now this is when, and again, I'm not, my purpose tonight, you have to be very selective in this because I love to tell the story of this conversation with this woman at the well, this woman from Samaria. And it's, it, to see Jesus take her just from her coming from the, for the mundane purpose of, of drawing water and leaving there a disciple who believed he's the Messiah and then going from there and because of her, many people will believe as Jesus is invited to stay. But that's not the part I want to tell. But it's related to that. Because when she leaves, the disciples came with some food. And in verse 32, Jesus says, I have food to eat of which you do not know. And the disciples are wondering, uh, did somebody bring him something to eat while we were gone? And Jesus said in verse 34, My meat, or my food, depending on your translation, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Now, he's not saying it's wrong to eat. Jesus ate, and it's necessary to eat. But what we see here with Jesus is that though he was weary and tired and sitting by the well and he's hungry, that with this wonderful conversation that took place, he was interested in this person that looked like probably the worst, sus- <laughs> the worst looking prospect anywhere. Uh, this, is, this is the, one, the woman that Jesus said that um, 
you have had five husbands and the man you have, verse 18, is not your husband. She had been around. She had a lot of baggage. She didn't look like a great prospect. And Jesus looked into her heart. He saw one who was wanting to know truth. And he got so involved in that conversation with her that he forgot about being tired and he forgot about eating. And oh, if we could just, that same, Jesus says, listen, food's important, but my food, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to accomplish his work. I'm living not to eat, but to do his will. Let's put with that John 8, 29. I always do the things that are pleasing in his sight. Let's put with that John 9, verse 4, the urgency expressed in that verse when Jesus said, we must work the works of him that sent me while it is yet day. The night cometh when no man can work. I'm talking about priorities. Our kids see when a sporting event is more important to us than a gospel meeting. Our kids see when recreation is more important to us than learning the truth of God's Word. We can talk all we wish about seeking first the kingdom, but our example speaks volumes. And with Jesus, He was consistent. He practiced what He was preaching. His priorities were, this one thing is most important. Let's do this one thing. It's like when He told His good friend Martha, you're anxious and troubled about many things. One thing is needful. And Mary has chosen that good part which shall not be taken away from her. I think from time to time we need to revisit this matter of Jesus, His priorities, and ask what about our priorities? Are we truly seeking first the kingdom? Is this a matter that it's really true with us that here's the most important thing. Our meat is to do the will of Him that sent me. That's what it's all about. And do we need a reminder that Saturday you cannot go full blast with everything else up till late in the night and be refreshed and prepared to worship the Lord on the first day of the week. It doesn't work that way. Amen. We need to look at, at the idea of preparing ourselves, a time of preparation to come together and, and be truly engaged in our worship to our Father. I'm just saying when we look at the man Christ Jesus, there could be no doubt about his priorities, his concern for doing the Father's will, and, and letting other things then fall into place, and how we, need, how we need to do that. We need to choose the one thing that is needful. Paul says, when Christ, who is our life, appears in Colossians 3. And so we're seeking the things that are above where Christ is, as that same passage says. Well, you've listened well tonight, and I appreciate that. I've, I've pointed out some things tonight kind of bearing my heart just a little bit. I hope you'll take that in the spirit in which it's intended. We need to be reminded about these things. We don't need to be drifting. And we need to refocus and redouble our efforts in serving our Lord together. We're all in this together. If you've not yet obeyed the gospel of Christ, we want to encourage you even tonight. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus as we stand and sing.